welcome to Eye of Faces episode 19, Scraps and Scrolls part 6 of History of Westeros' Valar Redis project. Hello, I'm Sir Berkeley, and you are here, like I say, at the Eye of Faces, and I'm talking to you from hot and humid England. It's apparently going to get hotter, so well done for us at being so good at weather. Today we will be going through all the extra leftover notes from Aziz and the Shares live stream this past Sunday uh, for the seven chapters in about midway through I think Aziz mentioned Game of Thrones. We are getting there even though as I think Aziz also mentioned we're really not overall but for this book for Game of Thrones halfway there. Before that let me give a, a very large thank you to everyone Last week we released one of our guest episodes, which are always amazing, always fun to do. And yes, thank you for all the retweets and likes and shares and obviously listens, of course. And also comments as well. We've received a lot of nice comments. Thank you to Lauren again, Shakes of Thrones, for coming on and talking to me and for uh, helping promote in the episode as well. Very much appreciated. I think I said it enough on um, on Twitter now, but amazing recording so good to listen to lauren talk about shakespeare and a game of thrones or a song of ice and fire and just everything she had an offer we, we tried some new games did some uh, icebreaker games they went down pretty well i think not too cheesy of me maybe and yeah we found out some great stuff about how this has all come together for lauren and what she's going to do going forward and gives great advice on how to appreciate Shakespeare within the scope of uh, Westeros or how to just appreciate in general so please do go back and give that a listen if you can we really appreciate it back to today first off hello to our patrons you'll be listening to this a day early so hey well done you and uh, of course thank you for your continued support and hello to everyone else as well much appreciated still for the listen hope you enjoy so today seven chapters as always um, we're back from a little gap because uh, Aziz and Cher were off at Con of Thrones having a wonderful time while I was sat here in England. I think it's doubly harsh, the scheduling this year of uh, Con of Thrones because it, there's first Con of Thrones, which I didn't get to get to, and then also a year ago this time, I was on my honeymoon. So I was pretty down this week. I'm not at Con of Thrones and I'm not on my honeymoon. I'm just here with the dog. And all these notes to do as well, so at least it keeps me distracted, because there's lots of notes to get through. A reminder of the um, of the chapters we're going through today, it is Eddard 7, Tyrion 4, Aya 3, Eddard 8, Catelyn 6, Eddard 9, and finally Daenerys 4. So as you can see, or as you can hear, a lot of Eddard in the very heavy uh, King's Landing, three Ned chapters, which I don't think we've had uh, as many of one person in one week so far so yeah lots of king's landing but we also go wild we go off in the veil and we get to visit some key sites the eerie based off rack which kind of the eerie comes back faced off rack we can assume will come back but big gaps between them we're definitely kind of reaching the third quarter here i would say if we want to talk some basketball which i always do it's really getting to a turning point. We're about to enter the last act of this, not of the book, we're not quite there yet, but of this specific Ned uh, investigation plot. It's getting quite dark, quite uh, doomy, and the intensity is ratcheting up, as we will see as we go. So let's get into it then. Eddard 7, which I'm sure you'll recall opens with Ned and Barristan the Bold standing over the body, the corpse of Sir Hugh of the Vale after his death in the uh, in the lists in the jousting so uh, i think aziz touched on this but we can see already ned's respect for barristan uh, has grown and it's really display on here they, they kind of mirror images of each other a lot in common they're both a bit older ned's younger than barristan obviously but neither of them are the the boys of summer that we're seeing so much in the tourney they are you know they're experienced they're veterans they both come from the soldier mold they fought and uh, it's been through wars and both of them have seen children die and are deeply affected by it we don't get that from Barristan so much yet but we will later on in dance when we finally get to his POV um, and like as he's mentioned obviously he kind of has almost exact repeat of this scene with Quentin later and also in this conversation we have uh, Ned with his he's saying none of us is ever ready and he's referring to death, obviously. So right from the get-go, this is kind of a couple of paragraphs in, and we're getting this doom being 
cranked up because Ned's saying he's not ready for death and we know what's coming for him. So it's all it's all getting laid out there pretty thick and pretty thick by George now. He knows how to paint an atmosphere for certain. Now a few weeks ago uh, we linked John John Snow to being being like a young athlete who can't envision a future without sport or in John's case fighting. This is back on uh, I think it might be his first chapter up at Castle Black when he talks to Donald Noy and you know, he's basically thinking that fighting is all there is and he can't imagine how Donald Noy only has one arm and he's basically his life's over and he's you know he's just showing that bit of immaturity. So if John is the young version of that athlete who can't envision a, a future Robert here is the other side. He is the old athlete who's already passed it, but they can't let go. Robert can't imagine himself as anything other than the warrior because the warrior is who he, who he is. That's his image. That's his his thing. And I think probably Robert, he just wants to be good at something. He just wants to be allowed to do something that he knows how to do. He knows the rules and he can he can just do it because it's not lost on him that he can't really rule the kingdom he's not very good at it he's not very good at the politics and he doesn't have any interest in that anyway so you can just imagine him saying oh, just please just let me do the fighting i know how that works can you just let me one afternoon that's all i'm asking and you know obviously the whole point of this chapter is that he can't do that for several reasons uh one unbeknownst to him is that he might die if he does so and there's been a few in the past few chapters there's been a few parallels between robert and cersei which I think we all agree is one of the better added scenes from the show when they had that one conversation about their marriage. It's very, really good about how they're actually kind of in the same position, even though they hate each other. It's, it's just an interesting uh, that relationship, how they butt heads like that. And though we don't get that in the book, there are references to how they are, again, in similar situations. So here we have Robert being, he's old and fat, but he's, he's kind of oblivious to it and Cersei puts on weight herself later on in Feast when she's the de facto ruler of the realm and I think Robert he does know well, he obviously knows that he's got put on a few pounds but he's he's too frustrated to admit it to himself he still thinks he can go out there and knock anyone who wants to try he's not really thinking that he is actually older and probably not what he used to be whereas Cersei doesn't even get to that point she still seems classically classic Cersei genuinely oblivious she said, no, the dresses are getting tighter. It's not me. Someone's messing with my dresses. And although we can't really forgive her for that bit, the idea for both of Cersei and Robert basing so much of their worth on their self-image is kind of fair because that's how they've got to where they are. Robert knows that he, in large part, won the throne because he's got that warrior image, and as well as the fact he backed up the talk in being able to fight. In the same way, Cersei knows that she, as the queen, is judged on her beauty so much and that's how she's been able to manipulate men and um, how she's got where she is today and when she starts to lose that, it's kind of a diminishing power and she doesn't really know who she is also in the same way that Robert wouldn't be. As we move through this conversation with Robert, we get on to, for all his faults, Robert is actually kind of aware and thinking about his legacy when he references you know, what would happen to the realm if he just up and left it. He knows what Joffrey's like, he knows what Cersei's like, and even though he doesn't want to directly address it, he reveals to Ned that he, has, he is actually thinking of his duty in a, his own kind of strange way. Which is sad, because what he fears about Joffrey and Cersei is exactly what comes to pass, so he's actually pretty dead on here. Then again, it's one thing to know the problem, but he doesn't. he's still not making any steps to change it. So he, he'd rather kind of be, oh, woe is me, and have a little bit of moan to Ned, rather than actually do something really difficult and try and heal the realm it's too big of a thing to comprehend for Robert I think we've talked before about him being he wants to avoid failure instead of try and get success in the political arena on the melee or in the battlefield that's a that'd be a different story he'd rather go for the big swing and take out the big guy or whatever but in here no he'd rather just leave it rather than try and do something that actually protect the realm now it does hint at his interest in marrying Marjorie uh, which is Renly's kind of side plot, which if that had happened, would have opened up the floodgates to major change, but we never quite get there. I mean, we can discuss whether that's because of his premature death and would he, maybe would he eventually ended up doing something about it if he'd given more time? Mm. There's an argument to be had either way. We could see him maybe, maybe Ned sparks him into doing something. Maybe he keeps going with the status quo over the last couple of decades. Final part on the melee, uh, it's a good, pretty good comparison between Robert and Joffrey in 
Joffrey wants to be spoiled and get everything easy because, you know, he's the king, so that's what's supposed to happen. And I think we could easily envision a, if Joffrey was a few years older, if he was kind of Rob's age, John's age, maybe even a bit older, we could envision him, he would love to be in a melee where no one can touch him. I think we can pretty easily picture Joffrey just swing around a mace where people have to just stand there and take it. But Robert, obviously, he wants the challenge. Big difference between them there. Even though this is more of a, a Ned versus Robert chapter, not so much. We're going to get more of that later on today. But this is them. It's still Ned going against what Robert wants to do in a more forceful way than we've had so far. But even then, you can see Ned still, he's still clinging to the belief that Robert will listen to him eventually and he can turn him around. I think it's a case of nostalgia breeding nostalgia because Robert, he remembers the war and that makes him, you know, these images of him being the warrior and being the, the muscle man makes him think he can take on the melee. So the knock-on effect of that is Ned kind of remembering that Robert also. It's the, he's actually kind of transferring his own nostalgia to Ned. So Ned thinks of that younger Robert and again kind of clouds his own vision thinking, well, maybe he will listen to me because I remember what that young Robert was like instead of really looking at which Robert version he has in front of him. Going back to the, the jousting itself, we've got Ned and Sansa having an, an, a, a little conversation. We don't really get that many Ned and Sansa moments until a bit later when it's all going really wrong. Ned's more concentrated on Aya, it seems, or at least that's the ones we see more of. But as for the jousting itself, we've got Gregor again. He's up first. And although George is very good at, I'm sure this has been said before, he's very good at not painting characters too much one way or the other in terms of good versus evil, but Gregor, he is the exception. We get that fairly quickly. He is one of the full-on tropes. He's just evil. There's not really much else to discuss. We don't get any Clegane family backstory to this point, but that is going to come back with Sandor later. We know that. But we do get Ned thinking about a bit about it here, about the, the keep and you know the dad and the accidents. I wonder if Tywin has ever had to put in some effort into covering up whatever is happening at uh, Gregor's keep, because it is in his land, obviously, and he probably doesn't want everyone to know what his mad, mad dog, so to speak, is up to. But then again, can you really see Tywin lifting a finger if he doesn't have to? Having said that, maybe Gregor's just learned a lesson to use accidents as the reason for um, for family murders because that's definitely what Cersei was planning to do right here, right now, with the melee. And we see it again later on the boar hunt. So same thing with Jamie and Bran. That was supposed to, you know, Bran was just supposed to fall, but instead of Jamie actually murdering him. So is Gregor kind of sitting down watching Cersei and Jamie and taking notes? Probably not. He's probably not even bothered that much about covering up. Now opposite him is Loras Tyrell, which his description, to be fair, is also over the top tropey. We get to know Loras a lot better than Gregor, but for now, this first image, well, not first image, but we're getting another look at him, is still Mr. Shining Knight, and he's got his cloak of flowers, and just, it's too good to be true, which we do find out, because he plays a, a kind of dirty, underhanded trick, despite that over overly chivalristic description, which is a hint, we don't find out now, but we will later, about how the Tyrells operate, actually. They've got the roses, they all look very nice, they're rich and they have all the food. But underneath, they're still pretty high and mighty on the dirty tricks and the politics and, and the, playing the game. It seems like the trick with the horse is a good mirror to what Renly is actually doing with Robert and Marjorie. If we want to say that uh, uh, Gregor's big war horse is standing in for Robert, the big warrior, and if we want to say uh, Renly's horse is the Marjorie, then they're trying to tempt Gregor's horse with Loris's horse, or in other words, they're trying to tempt Robert with Marjorie. Now we don't know of the connection between Renly and Loris yet, but this is this is basically the animal version of Renly's plot, so we can uh, see that better as a reread. And after that, we get the fight between Sandor and Gregor, and it's very interesting to me that Sandor doesn't take any killing cuts to Gregor's face, despite the you know he's taken off his helm. So the opportunity is there, and the motive certainly there for Sandor, but he doesn't. He just defends, which probably likely endears himself to Sansa a bit more later on. But I wonder why it is Sandor doesn't do that. Is it because he doesn't want to kill? He doesn't want to kill Gregor for Loras because he's defending Loras at this point. So he doesn't want. He doesn't kind of want to. Maybe he doesn't want to share the kill. Maybe he wants to do it for himself later, just one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe he doesn't want to be doing it in this official setting, especially when he's so loathing of that setting and structure of 
knights and the court and politics in general. Maybe he just wants it away from all that, literally one-on-one, -on -one, no one even watching, Sandor versus Gregor. Who knows? Maybe we'll find out one day. Maybe not. Now, and then Ned and Varys, they get together for a conversation after this in the, uh, the kind of final chunk of this chapter. And they kind of fill the same role as each other. In the beginning, it's Ned saying the tough stuff to Robert, saying, no, you can't fight, look at yourself. And it's not going to happen. At the end, it's Varys saying the tough stuff to Ned later on and about you've got to realise what's going on here. It's probably a fairly large awakening to Ned that he wasn't seen as immediately trustworthy. Varys says, I had to cut, I had to watch you and make sure you were, I could trust you. And Ned probably, he's not used to that. Everyone knows Ned. He's the most honourable person around. Everyone can trust him. So he's probably kind of grown lax and gotten used to his own reputation preceding him here, especially having been in the North with definitely everyone knows you and knows they can trust your word, etc. So maybe that is actually the best way to have him realise that anyone can be acting in King's Landing. If someone else can even see him, the great and honourable Ned Stark, as a possible liar, then maybe that kind of gets through to Ned that anyone can be lying. In the same vein, I think, I'm pretty sure this is the first mention of uh, Marion Trant and Boris Blunt being on the, on the take for the Lannisters. There hasn't really been any hints about that at all, I'm pretty sure. So it tells the reader, and Ned also, that anyone can be in anyone's pay, which all seems, is, a lot of these things seem so obvious on reread, but if we cast our minds back to first-time readers, it's, it's really not, not yet. I think Ned is really starting to click that it's not just people with the last name Lannister who are dangers here, but who is on the Lannister payroll, who else is plotting against him. He's finally becoming aware of how actually surrounded he is, and it may maybe it gives him a bit of better of a, a bit of a better understanding of Cersei's game and what she's up to here. But having said that, he obviously doesn't realise quite enough by the time the end comes. Varys gives a little retelling of Sir Hugh's uprising and how he got to where he is. And actually, if you look at it, that's pretty much a parallel to Littlefinger's own story that we know of much later. So I wonder, does Varys know that? And he's kind of trying to subtly tell Ned, hey, look, this kid from the Eyrie, uh, from the Vale, rather, he's actually got the exact same success story as this other guy from the Vale who you should probably keep an eye on. Or is does Varys not actually know that and it's George himself laying out for us? We don't know. Now, although Varys does share a lot of information with Ned here, we've got to remember he's not playing all his cards straight up. That's not Varys' style. He needs Ned to go at a certain pace, which we're going to talk about in a minute in the Aya chapter. But he's also playing a game with Littlefinger, where Ned is just a playing piece. He's just something to be used, and obviously Littlefinger views him the same way. So we've got to remember that. He's not friends. A lot of the themes in this chapter and in these conversations, they're repeated later during the deathbed scene for Robert and in the black scene... Back and in the black cell scene for Ned just before they both obviously meet their end. So we're going to... We'll have to remember these in a few weeks' time when we come back. We've also got hints about uh, Maya Stone, which I know as he's uh, mentioned a bit later on in one of the later chapters about the structuring of George here, and he's just kind of sowing these seeds because, hey, presto, she turns up in a few chapters' time. So that's, well, that's convenient, isn't it? Good job, George. And finally for this chapter, before we move on, there's the quote from Robert. He says, Last tourney, he dumped the Kingslayer on his golden rump. Now, Robert is actually dangling the potential truth right in front of Ned's face here. If that we're talking about the, the cat's paw dagger and how Littlefinger has kind of wrapped both Ned and Catelyn around this one question of the, the dagger. And Robert, really, he's almost asking Ned to ask him about this tourney where the dagger kind of originated. And if Ned had just reached out and asked about it, asked who bet on who and who round, wound up with what, he might have been able to unravel Littlefinger's part in all of this maybe even leading on to what Cersei's up to it really could have just changed everything but he does he just doesn't even click that this is something to be worried about at the moment he just thinks Robert's going on about past tourneys and past fights so it's up to us to just think oh Ned what, what could have been but there we go on to Tyrion 4 instead and I've forgotten to give a, a, a chapter name haven't I again it's because the season of Shared is so much better out here. It's almost pointless to be doing it. But I'll, I'll keep going regardless. So uh, Ned, what was that? Ned Ned 7, wasn't it? Ned 7, the one with the dirty horse trick. That's what we'll call it. Now we're on to Tyrion 4, which is easily the one with the clansman attack. That's how to best remember it. 
Uh, and Aziz got to my note about how the opening of this chapter really sets a scene for, you know, they're in the wild, they're in, we're off the beaten track here, so to speak. And all the structure and the politics that this book has been building up so strongly because we need the world being built, the feudal structure being built. So that's been a, a prime focus, but now we're out of it already. And lots of characters are going to have to go through the... Um, through not having the comfort of name and status later on and Tyrion is obviously a prime example once he not only here but much later on when he basically abandons his family name and has to learn how to get by without it so we've got some shades of that now but this chapter jumps around a little bit because before we get to the action and the attack we have Tyrion remembering kind of his version of events from Catelyn's last chapter where she arrests Tyrion and I like to think that him thinking of even though uh, the, 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 some of them are knights some of them are knights or kind of nobles that help Catelyn in this in this regard also there's the small folk in the inn and none of them Tyrion mentions none of them like jump to his defense or anything like that and some actually actively help and I like to think that the this the small folk turning on Tyrion is kind of comparable to how the small folk of King's Landing later view him even though he helps them so much and saves them basically they still he's still the evil imp to them there's still the image that they cling to. Same vein, there's some fray foreshadowing in the you know, one gets up but then realizes the others are cut they're staying sat down, they're gonna see which way things go. That's a little bit of foreshadowing. We know what Ward Frey's game is later in Storm of Swords. I know especially because I just read uh, Catelyn's final chapter in the Storm of Swords, which I'm not emotionally ready to talk about. It was only yesterday, so let's just move on. Let's talk instead about Masha Heddle, because that's that's a more fun subject, right? Maybe not. So Masha, she's kind of a, a follow-up to Micah as she's the second innocent Riverland who's getting caught up in the game. And, uh, okay, nothing's happened quite yet, but we know what's going to happen in not very long, just a couple of chapters' time. And we can see, Tyrion sees through this uh, memory that the other people at the inn and the small folks, they resent the highborns because they know it's them the small folk who are going to get suffer that's a a common a strong theme for a game of thrones for the entire series we all know that it's those though those people who will suffer and get pulled in and used up for just pieces on a board really Catelyn and Tyrion they barge into their inn interrupt their lives and ask them for to pay for the privilege of this interruption with blood people are going to die in this chapter as we know but skipping forward from uh, Tyrion's memory let's get to the meat of this chapter which is obviously the the clansmen attacking so Tyrion mentions earlier that wit is his only gift but evidently not we see that's not quite true he displays his first his first real physical skills here if we're willing to just forget the somersault when he meets John, which I think we are he handles himself okay he saves Catelyn he doesn't die better men do better fighters do anyway and it's just setting up his role a bit for uh, the battle of the green fork battle of blackwater and maybe again in marine and maybe further maybe when he comes back to westeros who knows i think we do see a bit of Tyrion's true nature some of it being revealed when he saves Catelyn. he's not so dark as to just let her die even though it might help him out but then again is it more uh, a tywin shade of tywin type thing where he's thinking well if she does die then these people they're probably not going to keep me around for very long i do actually kind of need her but then we don't actually get Tyrion's in a monologue on this it just says he's moving before he even knows so even Tyrion doesn't know why he's exactly doing it but we can at least guess there's some some hints about Tyr who Tyrion really is he's not the angry a vengeance filled character that he's been painting himself as so far in this chapter and to be fair this the saving people thing it does come back through his story later on um he saves jorah he saves penny much later and that's when he's a much darker character so it does get repeated despite uh, he ends up in a much worse situation than he does here in the same way, when he does save Catelyn, she responds by cutting the throat of that clansman. So that's a bit of foreshadowing for her cutting um, Jingle Bell's throat in Storm. I, get, I can't talk about it. We're going to have to skip past this one. I'm going to get emotional. This whole attack is a good follow-up to Sansa's recent tourney chapter about this songs not being sung. We see it straight away. There's people, they're, both, they're noble, they're uh, small folk, they're, they're peasants, if you like, and their lives are lost either way. 
and they're losing them for what really they take one person one guy to one place and that same person leaves again a few weeks later free as a bird so what what was the point in all that really why did they die people literally lost their lives just for and this is this um theme of coming in interrupting small folks lives and literally ending them for nothing for this teeny tiny part of a larger game it's quite interesting really that Tyrion is our intro um our pov intro into small scale fighting this is really the first we're gonna have a few kind of short little skirmishes in this these chapters and next week's chapters but really this is the first one but he's also our first full bone battle pov later at the green fork and there will be bigger battles in the green fork of course but like i said this is our introduction i think if you knew all the povs and who they were before reading the book and you were kind of given a list of what the major plot points you wouldn't think that Tyrion is the intro to fighting you'd be looking at John or Ned I would imagine so again now this attack is happening it's that dial being turned the intensity is growing now it's into a physical realm instead of Ned's kind of um, hypothetical overhanging cloud scenario we've seen practice and Castle Blackyard we've seen attorney and King's Landing so that's kind of the pretend fake fighting now into the real thing and Tyrion is quite shrewd in flipping the idea that the land can hold him prisoner. There's a uh, someone says that they don't even really need to guard him anymore because what's he going to do? He can't run away, just die anyway. So the land is guarding him as much as anything else. But he's clever enough to flip that. And he's kind of pointing out that Catelyn should be just as scared of his death, or again, it's bringing those men to their deaths for nothing, and probably even more angry Tywin. We can imagine if he's if he does what he does just for Tyrion being kidnapped. Even though he might be privately happy that Tyrion there uh, dies, so you can imagine his reaction. I do love Tyrion's obsession over being tricked instead of his being kidnapped. He's, he's far more annoyed about the fact that uh, Catelyn tricked him about where they were going. It shows how much he values that whip, but then again it also highlights his Lannister pride, which we can see actually has some rather dire consequences later on. When he realises he's been tricked about Tysha also in that last conversation with Jamie, that really sets him down a, a dark path. It also sells again the idea of Tyrion being Tywin's son, him being the Tywin instead of Jamie. We start off with him promising retribution on the Stark family, even though he's actually really only come into conflict with Catelyn, not the whole family. Um, he shows them skill at arms, and let's not forget, Tywin did fight in the Nine, War of the Nine Penny Kings, and especially he's prideful in his wit and his planning, and his, um, and again, that possible self-preservation in saving Catelyn. We can all imagine Tywin kind of fitting into those scenarios. No, on the clansmen quickly then, you know, these people at the inn, they had the battle brought upon them. They got swept up and taken along in the name of kind of honour and duty. The clansmen, they're the same in a way. They do get swept up in everything, even though, you know, they choose to attack them uh, at the Catelyn's party. They're the aggressors. But eventually, when Tyrion comes back and gathers them all up, even though, again, they, they come and attack him, they will get chewed up and spit out by the war effort too. They get to go to King's Landing and fight in the um, preparations for Stannis, etc. And then at the end, uh, I think it's at the beginning of Storm. I can't remember. It might be maybe the end of Clash, but I remember Tyrion's chapter. He just finds out that they basically just chased off. They come back to the city gates and no, we don't need you anymore. Go home. So, and again, both sides of it, small folk, clansmen, they all get put in the big machine and then they get spit back out again. Catelyn mentions that she wants to find stones and bury the dead, and that just reminds me of Ned and the Tower of Joy. He, he builds the cairns. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. Cairns, cairns, but that just that was a quick note. And obviously this chapter is a big building block in the relationship between Tyrion and Bronn, and it, it sets up Bronn volunteering to be the Tyrion's champion, and I think it's Tyrion's next POV, so that'll be next week probably. I wonder if Tyrion sees some of Jamie's skill in Bronn, but, they have, but him and Bronn have a closer personality because obviously Jamie's always so um, concentrated on Cersei when they were growing up and he is supposed to be a knight whereas Bronn is the more kind of devious miscreant that Tyrion is so they're a bit closer, maybe now as we finish this, last point for Tyrion 4 aside from the deaths obviously which is quite a large thing to ignore Catelyn does have a very successful chapter she gets out of Tyrion that it wasn't his dagger which also knock on means that Littlefinger lied to her and we told it off with so the fact that Littlefinger is boasting about her virginity, so that all adds into, you know, what is he up to? She still has a very valuable hostage in Tyrion, and things are kind of looking bright. She's nearly at the veil, which she, at this moment in time, sees as this respite and safety, and finally going to get help from Lysa. We'll talk about 
how uh, <laughs> what happens there when we get to Catelyn's chapter in a moment. But at the end of this Tyrion chapter, she she thinks things are looking up. If she only she had been able to reconvene with Ned in any way and get this information about Littlefinger across, I don't think she takes his threat quite seriously enough because if Ned had known with everything that he's found out and piece that together could be a very different story alas again alas there's so much of the alas now we're on to Aya 3 the one now we're on to Aya 3 the one of the underground wizard where Aya goes down into the red keep and over here now I know uh, Aziz and Asher got through a lot of stuff on this loads and loads big big chapter obviously there's so much revealed and especially on reread we can really connect a lot so they got loads of stuff done but i do have some little notes as well it starts off with i chasing the cats we know that's quite a cool opening scene and it's these different training types again this is all this whole book is kind of the three john sansa and i are being trained in their respective arenas john's fighting in the yard sansa has been learning how to be a lady at the tourney and I was chasing cats. Bit different, not the traditional lady warrior training. Not usual, but pretty effective as we know later on. So she's going around, she's chasing these cats. Her mum is named Cat. She becomes Cat of the Canals. There's all these little connections like that George likes to put in. And after that, she meets up with Tom and Marcella. And I actually remembered this more as um, them just looking down on scruffy, dirty eye and not recognise her, thinking she's a boy again. But I forget, I forgot rather, before I reread it, that they're actually worried about the cat. They were worried their eye is doing something about the cat, which is sweet in that Tommen and Marcella are very sweet, but also it's a bit of a heartache when you realise this is something they probably had to learn to look for growing up with Joffrey because we know what he likes to do with cats and those psychotic things. So lovely that they are so sweet. Horrible that they've probably had to really kind of try and look out for cats because of what their big brother does. But they are great. It's their, they're so adorable here and it's the biggest clash to look at them here and look at Joffrey and you think, why is he so different if it's, you know, the maybe they flipped a coin with him as well as the Targaryens or is it just being brought up as prince and, being, and getting everything you want or is it Cersei herself? Who knows, but good old Tom and Marcella. Now, after that, she runs away and Aya makes her way down into the depths of the Red Keep. I think it's quite similar to the House of Black and White in her later story in Feast and uh, Dance and how she slowly makes her way down and finds all these different levels and what are they up to. Quite a cool passage. It really gets across how horrible the Red Keep can be, especially if you're just a child and there's these really powerful images, images that George gets across here. And she ends up finding the dragon skulls and thinking that they're monsters, as you would. I just think it's nice that we're being told here that there's monsters in the basement and we know there's monsters up above in the throne room, like we just said with Joffrey. Uh, like I said, Aziz and Asher, they got some most of this, so I'm not going to uh, dance around it too much. But Varys and Illyro working together, we've got to remember that is a huge reveal on your first read. It's easy to forget again and seems obvious now, but we really had no inkling previously. We thought Varys is working with Jorah, but that's kind of the only connection. This is a much more solid connection between Varys, Varys and Illyro, and it really bridges Essos and Westeros for the f first time reader. We get a much better sense of scale for the first time and how these two words are interconnected. And they get on to talking about their little birds and how they gain their information. Obviously, I is, this is all going over Aya's head, really. But we know, unfortunately, as rereaders, exactly what they are talking to. And it's a very, very creepy scene of just how they talk about these poor children. as uh, like, Almost like they're gadgets, really, like they're recording devices. And to read between the lines and think of the gistics and how they get the children and how they, what they do to the children, it's a horrible business, so I don't think we really want to get into here. But just thinking, you know, how many have they used? How many have died over the years? It boggles the mind. We can compare it to the, the later Stannis question that he has to face with uh, Davos being kind of his conscience and Melisandre maybe tugging in the other way. What is the world versus one boy? So in this version, is the realm, if Varys is really trying to save it, is the realm worth hundreds of dead, mutilated children? It's weird insight into kind of philosophy and ideology and just 
the window into Varys's mind. I wonder because we do note that he, in other cases, tries to actively save children, seems to have like a soft spot for them, also almost. So I wonder if that's is that his form of guilt, and he's trying to compensate. Is it just a way to appear nice in the ears? We don't, we just don't know. It's a it's a nice little flash forward to the last scene we get in the whole series so far. This is our introduction to Little Birds, but that dance epilogue with uh, Kevin, that's the end of our story so far. So they're here be- near the beginning and they're here and they are there at the end as well. I wonder, what do we think happens when these little birds of Varys and Illyrios, when they get too big for certain shafts and the crooks of the Red Keep? Obviously, there are large enough pastures if Varys is still getting around, but you've got to think at some point, when they, these children get a bit older, they outlive their usefulness. And, well, we can probably make a guess what happens to them then, but I don't, again, let's not go into it. Now, Varys says, treat them gently. So it gives the impression he's not taking personal enjoyment out of it. Again, we're going back to that. Is he just thinking this is the way I can save more people, save more children? Who knows? That's too, that's too complex a question to get into. So I'm not really sure if we can count that as a plus that he's saying treat them gently because he's also saying treat them gently but cut out their tongues. But it's an interesting parallel to Kyburn who will fill this role later who seems to have, he seems to at least have a more personal investment in his tortures of Lady Stokeworth and whoever else he gets down there. Now, like I've said, we've got that ratcheting doom going up. We've got actual fighting in Tyrion's chapter. And this chapter is not one to be left out. There's a real sense of the pan boiling over in, in this all these chapters today to be honest everything's everything's kind of being set into action now we're moving past the talking stage of the book everyone is now to move into action because ned is getting closer and closer to the truth so now varus is acting cersei is get, reacting trying to get robert killed renly is acting trying to get this marjorie thing through and the timing is so tight and so much could have easily changed on a, on a dime on a coin flip so this is put pretty succinctly in this chapter this getting that idea across Finally then for this chapter, like I say, as he's got through uh, to most of it, there's some theories about the this uh, black cat, I think he's the one with one ear, the tomcat, belonging to Rhaenys, Rhaegar's daughter, Rhaenys Targaryen. And who knows, but if so, I like to take that as a symbol that there are still these traces of that former Targaryen court alive, whether, whether it's the cat, whether it's Viserys over in um, Estos, whether it's fake Aegon drifting around wherever he is, young Griff at the moment. It's just a little hint. And who knows if George is really thinking that far ahead of this or if we're just reading into it. But I'd like to just take it as some as a trace of that court that nothing's ever really gone. But let's go forward rather quickly. We're back to Ed again already. Eddard 8, the one with the resignation, the walkout resignation, the slamming down of the pin and off we go. We like it. And this Ned chapter starts off in the middle of the conversation, or the middle of an argument in this case. And that's something I've noticed seems pretty common. This happens for almost all of Ned, Ned's chapters, especially in King's Landing. Um, so that's just an interesting note on how George likes to set out the different different POVs as uh, chapters and starts. So as he's mentioned about, um, I picked out this quote about from Robert about the shadow of the axe, and he's actually looking in the wrong way, and it's making him kind of Aries-like. But... To counter that, that's all true, but he is also sort of kind of on point because although there is a much bigger, more relevant immediate danger in Cersei and the Lannisters, the Targaryens, they are a danger, even though Robert is going about it in a despicable way, how he wants to deal, deal with it. There are people who do want the Targaryens back and there are people who throw in with her when she becomes powerful enough if we look south to Dawn, etc. Or at least thinking about it. So Robert isn't wrong, and we should probably give him at least a little more credit for being able to recognise that. Not that he ever guessed that dragons were going to enter the equation, and I doubt he ever really thought that Daenerys was a danger herself. He was more concerned with either Viserys or Drogo or Danny's child. So Daenerys is just a footnote to Robert. She's just an extra person to kill because of her surname. Just because Robert is long dead by the time that Daenerys does become a, um, a factor in Westeros, or is threatening to, doesn't mean we should just discount his foresight completely. And in the, in terms of Robert kind of uh, shadowing Ares here, you got to imagine Ned is kind of looking at him and seeing that, and in his mind, if he, do, if he was to go along with Robert ordering the death of children, and he is basically saying that whatever Ares did was okay as well, and then and that in turn makes everything that he suffered and 
and everyone else suffered in that war completely pointless. So there's just there's no way Ned can condone that at all. There's no way he can co- connect that idea in his mind. He gives a, Ned gives all these reasons, all of these possibilities of what could go wrong. Uh, you know, what could go wrong? The reasons they don't have to send assassins, and he is actually, ironically, fairly accurate. Danny's child does die in infancy. Robert has his own irony in that if the assassins hadn't come, then Drogo and the Dothraki, they might have not stirred and looked to Westeros, which I think they might have got to on the uh, live stream, actually. Although, obviously, Danny would have tried to get them across anyway. But it's more Cersei, Robert and Cersei comparisons that I see. The, she is very self-fulfilling of her own prophecy with the Valonqar, or at least we think she is. And um, you can see a little example of Robert doing the same thing. As he's mentioned the other quote that I think I think we've probably all referenced it a few times in these uh, uh, previous Nedard, Nedard, these previous Eddard chapters about um, you know what did we rise against Darius Targaryen for if not to put an end to the murder of ch- children to put an end to Targaryens Robert says and yeah like as he said there's a lot to say about that quote but I'm thinking again if we try and put ourselves in, ne- in Ned's shoes that's got to be a spine tingling sentence to hear isn't it given what he's been hiding up at Winterfell for 15 years, and now Robert is saying again to put an end to Targaryens, if that whole war, that whole rebellion was worth it just to kill Targaryens, whereas Ned obviously thought it was a very, very, very different reason, so did many other people, but if that was really Robert Robert's thing, that was what he was willing to do to kill Targaryens, imagine, well, what could happen if he did find out about Jon. So every fear... Uh, Ned has had about John's identity being discovered is suddenly just staring him in the face and promising death to them, and everyone he can. Pycelle has a little butts in in this conversation about what was kind of we could kill one girl or we could have a war and hundreds could die or thousands could die. It's very similar, very, very similar to Tywin's later speech on the Red Wedding uh, asking if it's kinder to kill 12 at a dinner table or 12,000 in the battlefield or whatever it is. So little link there, little hint of similar ideology between Pycelle and Tywin. Maybe, yeah, just giving us an idea of why they are seemingly close. Then again, it's also kind of bullshit because Pycelle did vote for opening the gates for the sack of King's Landing. So I don't think we can really say he's bothered about loss of life or you know loss of innocence to children and women especially in that in that sack. As we go around the table in this small council meeting, so Littlefinger... He starts talking about when you find yourself in a in bed with an ugly woman, so on and so forth. And is he just talking about his relationship with Lysa? Is this one of these things where he can't he just can't resist putting double meaning into every sentence he says, little thing? I don't think he can just be direct at all. Next round the table, it's Varys, and he brings up the tears of Lys. Now, that's interesting, because I wonder, is he is he saying that to make Pycelle or Littlefinger uncomfortable? Because maybe he knows something, maybe he doesn't. Is he just dropping that as a uh, a subtle, I know what you did, don't think I don't know, type thing to make them sweat while they're at the table? Or maybe not. Maybe he's maybe it's unconnected. But that's a dangerous game because it does work both ways. Because for people who know a little bit less, like Robert and possibly Ned in this situation, now Varys is connected to the Tears of Lease because he brought them up. So if that was ever discovered, you'd probably have people thinking it was him involved as well. It's interesting that Targaryens are basically the only thing in the whole book that can push Robert into actually doing something, into actually being proactive. Normally he hands it off to the council, or he ignores it, or he shouts it. But this is this is the one thing where he's like, no, I'm actually I'm saying this is what we're doing now. I'm not hearing anything else. I wonder if Ned hadn't resigned, whether there are any loopholes that he could have possibly exploited to say Tyrion was taking under taken under the power of his position rather than just him saying that it was his command to Catelyn. So I guess he kind of does do that when Jaime um, confronts him, which we'll see in a few mi- a few minutes. But either way, I don't think that really stops anything at the end, and it's not enough to stop people like Tywin, certainly. But maybe he could have bought himself some time, who knows. We also get our first mention of the Faceless Men in this chapter, which is quite cool, right after, like I say, I had that chapter with a heavy House of Black and White vibes and... Some of her training definitely foreshadowed there, so that's a nice little connection. Um, this chapter, it really ends after Ned throws down his pen. And he's, he goes back to his room, slams the door shut, starts thinking about going home and just getting the hell out of here, basically. Not a bad thought. But it's really, it ends on a, it's, it doesn't end on a cliff, it just 
ends on a tease of a cliff because when Littlefinger comes to Ned, starts talking to him, this is basically the point of no return. I think we can probably agree if Ned had just got on the boat, got Sansa and I, just got out, went home. That's not to say anything would have been, you know, perfectly solved and we all live happily ever after. But it would have been probably better than what they got. But then Littlefinger comes, and Ned tips over the edge and there's no going back up that cliff. He's almost out, but he just gets dragged back in by the worst possible person to get dragged back in by because he's the person who actually dragged you in in the first place. Littlefinger. This is the beginning of the end for Ned and we can really trace it probably to this decision to go with Littlefinger on this last little um, lead that he provides instead of just saying, no, whatever, okay, John Aaron's murdered, I know that, I'm probably not going to find out by going home and saving my children. Also, on top of that, it's just the what-ifs he says about going home and maybe I can drop in on Stannis and uh, compare notes and thinking about what would have happened if those two had got together. I think we've already mentioned it several times in the past couple of weeks. Blows your mind, really what could have happened so in this chapter we've gone from the hypothetical to the real we're jumping from memories of death throughout the book to actually having to deal with it from thinking that robert is a good king to him actually to ned really doing something about the fact that he's not and from being wistful about home to nearly actually going but of course not quite alas i'll say it again i'll just say that at the end of every chapter shall i alas what could have been oh the mistakes of this particular book Okay, Catelyn 6. So what's that? Is that second? No, we've got three more. Catelyn 6. So this is the one with the blackfish. All we need to know. I could leave it there. Do so I think there's anything else in this chapter worth talking about, is there? Pretty sure it's just the blackfish. One of my favourite characters, of course. Uh, I think, actually, that was the first thing I ever wrote for um, History of Westeros, the blackfish essay. So you can see why. And he has this um, instant conversation with Catelyn that, as he's got to got to on Sunday. But he's also, he's showing off his political mind. We know he's a warrior. We know he's a good family man. He's a great uncle. The best uncle in the series. He's got my vote. But he's also politically minded. He's far more in tune with the geogra- geographical ramification of what Catelyn's done in relation to River Run being in danger. And he's also very aware of the atmosphere and the way the tide is turning in the Vale. Maybe that's because he's the only one not actually trying to get anything out of Lysa. He's just there observing so he, he can just get a clearer picture than everyone else there at the moment. Even though he says about Lysa not doing a great job ruling the Vale, he is also... Uh, quite understanding of why and you know he says to Catelyn that Lysa's had a much rougher time of it than she has I think he's this never really gets explored because Brynden obviously goes back to Riverrun with um, Catelyn but he is the only one who un- understands exactly what Lysa's been through and how it's affected her and I don't think he even knows about the, the forced abortion the tansy kind of stuff that we learn about later maybe he does don't know i i have hypothesized in the past that maybe he at least knows some of the story and that's why he specifically went to the veil vale, um after the girls got married but who knows either way he's much more in tune than you would give him credit for i think just on first meeting uh like i said before there's so ned had information dangled in front of him by robert about that previous tawny and and he also very nearly made the right decision to leave king's landing that like we just said in the same vein Catelyn very nearly buys into Tyrion's versions of events about the knife, but just doesn't quite doesn't quite get there. She could have done something here, but things just run away, run away. I guess, yeah. Alas, again. No, I'll save that for the end of the chapter. Let's cut cut that. Alas, we'll save it for the end. So Donald Wainwood, he comes along. He's in this chapter. I think I think you actually meet him before the Blackfish, but um, never mind. And he's kind of, um, he's a 20 year old and he's another kind of the, we could have easily seen him be the, the tawny, I think. He's dressed to, dressed to impress and he knows all the, he knows all the words you've got to say and all the proper ways to do it. But it's pretty stark contrast to going from Catelyn and Tyrion dealing with real life, dealing with the clansmen, life and death, to back to this kind of playing at knighthood. And obviously Donald Wainwood's probably probably never really seen any true danger maybe he has maybe he's gone out to fight the um the clansmen but definitely doesn't seem that way and i said that the knights of the veil vale, they do get a pretty rough time of it in this first book if you think right back to the beginning so waymar we know what happens there so he has just died uh so vardis egan he's gonna have a rough time coming up and donald he donald's a good name 
Donald doesn't really help that image because of all the pomp and circumstance and he's just kind of helping the argument that knights are more for ceremony while we've just seen sellsword Bronn with his notched sword actually do all the work and cut down multiple people. Now thinking forward, Catelyn often has times of melancholy during times of celebration, uh, depending on where she is. It happens in happens in River Run, they have the celebrations, she just kind of sits alone with um, Brienne, she's not in a great place. Obviously it happens at the Twins, she's quite morose at the Red Wedding. To be fair, she was dead on about that, so we won't hold that against her. But we're getting some seeds of that here when we're contrasting those early feelings of fatigue and woe about the deaths and the attacks that immediately contrasts with wonderful life-affirming descriptions of the veil so even with this beautiful sight before her and this whole um, this whole area of land that's all just about rebirth and, and life and beauty and she's still thinking about bad stuff and it's pretty down then again having said that the, that life-affirming description of the veil that's kind of flipped as soon as she actually gets up to the eerie uh, which is much later where it, that's actually described as quiet and lifeless and even though it's a pretty safe place and we can see why Lysa is drawn to being in this kind of isolation, safe isolation actually when we're looking at it as outsiders it's pretty probably pretty bad place for Lysa and her mentality that kind of isolation and as he spoke about the that cool relationship that interaction between Catelyn and Maya Stone and I just like specifically the instant, um, I think it's when they're crossing the stone bridge, which is, uh, like, like as he said, it's, it's fair enough that Catelyn admits she's not brave enough, that it's just a, a cool moment that she, that she, I think the line is she was forced to admit or something like that, um, that her bravery wasn't enough and she actually needed Maya. And then again, when she relents, she lets go of her pride and chooses to go up in the basket. And it's just a far cry from where she started at the beginning of the chapter with with that pomp and circumstance again from uh, Donald Wainwood went from that to riding up with the turnips and as I mentioned before Catelyn she thinks she's getting to she and probably the reader the first time reader they're led to think that we're reaching a point of safety and we've kind of got this safe little bubble far away from what's happening in King's Landing and, and Winterfell getting a bit of a respite from this building of doom in the Ned chapters where Team Stark can finally win one. Yeah, they're going to team up. Catelyn's getting back to her sister and she's got Tyrion. Cool. And that's kind of exemplified by the first meeting with Brynden because he's quite comforting and seems to know what he's doing. So we're we're, build, we're gathering allies now as Catelyn's in a really strong position. But then just as quickly that kind of gets swept away because Brynden says about you know what's up with Lysa and there's a few more hints of that the higher and higher that Catelyn goes up to towards this supposed safety spot and eventually we land on really shaky foundation not just when we meet Lysa but then again when we meet Sweet Robin and we're really kind of told oh actually things aren't they're not too great here either so that that safety spot that uh, safe zone probably not it doesn't seem as safe as we thought Sweet Robin he seen he kind of seems like another version of what's happened with Joffrey and Cersei where incompetent people are placed in roles of great authority just because of their birth in this feudal system. Joffrey inherits the throne because he was supposedly Robert's son in the same way that Sweet Robin has inherited the veil vale, and they've both got mums who are kind of unhinged and end up ruling with no, um, you know, they don't have to put a CV in and apply. They're just placed there and we see the effects. And this meeting with Lysa and, and uh, little Robin, little Robert even, it really makes Catelyn's journey, journey seem all the worst. We just said earlier on about the effort and the li lives spent, lives ended just to get them here. And for what? All it ends up with is a solemn, empty castle with an unhelpful sister who is clashing against each other. And that feeling of hope we had for Catelyn, that's gone. So what did these people die for? Again, it's just really, really shown on the microscope here. Let's get back to Ned for his final chapter in this, uh, his third chapter of this this, this week's uh, section. So this is the one in the rain. Obviously, there's a lot more to this chapter, but that's just how I remember. Just remember the rain. There's some very powerful language imagery going on with with the rainfall and you know just reflecting the feeling and then what happens and they have the fight in the rain. So, um, first the Shatea, her brothel, and the, the people within, they have a role to play later with other hands of the king, 
in the in Clash, obviously. So that's just a little a building block for later from George. But more interestingly, it's, it gets to me how there's a lot of Ned focusing on his vows here, and his vows and his promises and sticking to those vows. So it's interesting that he focuses on that before coming direct com- into direct conflict with Jamie, who at the time we all still believe to be a man who breaks his vows and doesn't care about them in general. And that is reinforced just after this when he skips town, essentially abandoning his Kingstar duty. So there's a nice contrast there. So Barra, the baby that um, that Ned finds in the brothel, she is a royal bastard. And it's another little hint that John also a royal bastard because Ned starts thinking of him immediately following this. Uh, so of course, obviously, this situation that Ned's going through is going to drag up all his feelings and all his Liana slash John memories and he even promises uh, Barra's mum as he promised Liana back then so it's just a lot of similarities he's obviously not that Ned isn't already thinking a lot about Liana and what happened there anyway with everything that's going on in his recent chapters but now you're getting really really quite close so no wonder he leaves and starts thinking so much about all that and all his promises, etc. Now for me, this connection to Liana it drums up sympathy for Daenerys and her situation. Let's not forget, we've just had this Ned chapter before about uh, a pregnant girl, a young pregnant girl far away and in, in a... It's very, very comparable actually to Liana at this point. Like I said, they were both young, kind of lost in the wild, so to speak. Daenerys is off in a, a really strange land and Liana was miles and miles from home. There's a complicated marriage relationship, whatever you want to call it, for Liana and Rhaegar. And the same with Daenerys and Drogo, at least in how they came together, to say the least. So, yeah, just interesting that they, uh, so they've so they got such similar situations. And, yeah, Aziz mentioned that I was I was confounded about Cersei selling these Cassidy Rock twins, the, the bastard twins that uh, Robert Father to Cassidy Rock, that she sold them to a passing slaver. So I just think... I just like to think: Is there one slaving company that insists on sailing around to the west side of Westeros for some reason? I like to think there's just one that bothers going around there. But aside from the the jokey part of it, this really does reinforce to us how far Cersei is actually willing to go. Because oh yeah, I actually I actually got that wrong, didn't she? She had the twins killed. I correct correct myself there. She had the twins killed, and she sold the mother into slavery. That's right. My bad there. So, yeah, killed two babies, sold a woman into slavery. It's just completely depraved, and we're going to get similar vibes into what we just discovered about Varys early on, about lengths that people will go to. Now, back to Ned, anyway. He's been questioning the rebellion the whole time. Just that last chapter, we had him looking at Robert and kind of seeing Ares, and so now he's moved on from Ares to thinking about Rhaegar. He's now pointedly asking himself if Rhaegar would have been the better king and that's that seems to be something he wouldn't he hasn't really considered yet because he doesn't he obviously doesn't try and give that much thought to Rhaegar given what happened there but now he's kind of saying well Rhaegar wouldn't have gone to brothels and we probably wouldn't have been in this situation so we I don't think really at this point we're given that information about there being the third option for Robert's Rebellion in this book it's kind of well there was the Mad King and there was Robert we're not really given uh, these hints about Rhaegar wanted to um, make this great council and maybe ascend and that all that comes later so but Ned's asking now if he made the if he could have maybe chosen a different course now when Jamie arrives he starts throwing the accusations out and he mentions about Tyrion. It's typical, honourable Ned, he shifts immediate focus off of Catelyn and he says he gave the order to uh, to arrest Tyrion, not Catelyn. It's nothing to do with Catelyn, she just did what I told her. Classic Ned, really. Probably maybe not the smartest idea, considering the situation, but that, that wouldn't even in- enter into his head. He's just getting the, the heat off his wife. He's got to get her out of the firing range, so to speak. And as he's mentioned, this, this Disneyfication of Jamie kind of being, you know, long, wet hair and uh, glinting smiles in the rain you can very very clear imagery as always from George here but one there's a few odd things it's very hard now that we've been inside Jamie's POV it's very hard to imagine him not just fighting Ned one-on-one I suppose the way that he does it and making the the guards fight his, Ned's guards technically it keeps him out of uh, kind of keeps him within the lines he hasn't actually touched Ned and he tells his men to leave Ned unharmed so he's still playing and within the rules kind of even though he still runs for it soon anyway but you would just imagine the Jamie we know 
would definitely want to, he would want to fight Ned one on one, wouldn't he? But there we go. I do think this little fight in the rain, there's some similarities to the Tower of Joy. I think on the flick chat, I might have called this the the one with the Tower of Joy, but this time it was raining or something like that. And because there was an outnumbered trio then as well, except it was Kingsguard facing Ned Seven. There was a Cassell there. It's Jory this time. I think it's Martin last time. Neither of them uh, do too well. And again, yeah, there's Kingsguard involved in both. That just links Barra to John and that whole situation sends Ned right back to the Tower of Joy again. And you can, we can see you know, he ends up going into a fever after this. So it's no surprise really that his fever dreams are focused around that because he's just been in a very, very similar situation. And there's a quote here. Littlefinger and the City Watch found him there in the street, cradling Jory Cassell's body in his arms. End quote. Just as they once found him holding Lyanna. It's, I think it's a very similar line. I can't remember where, where it is, but at some point he says that they found him like silently holding Lyanna in the, in the Tower of Joy. So again, really very strong similarities between that situation and this one. Whew. And like, yeah, so previous Ned chapter, we said point of no return now we see what we mean there because this is really just escalated let's go away finally from king's landing let's leave let's leave westeros entirely we're going to go east back to daenerys which has been a little while actually since we've visited her and let's get through these notes so this one is the one in vase off rack it's the one with it's the one for the last chance for viserys i think but vase off rack let's talk about that first because it's very interesting if you're going to get a kind of geography nerd on this city if you want to call it that. It's it's unlike anywhere else we, re we visit, especially in associ terms, associ terms. If we think about all the free cities and the and Slaver's Bay, they're all made up of city-states that all in order to make a very big deal about their walls, and yet here is one's completely open. They don't even bother having walls. That's how confident they are. And you know, it's, made, it's made up of all these stolen trinkets and statues of all the other places that they've conquered and done whatever with. It's just a real, very cool... Uh, to think about and very unique we don't visit anywhere else like this obviously because there is nowhere like this i also think it's cool that the jewel they've got the east west market which we get to more in uh, Daenerys' next chapter but they are mentioned here and it, so this is the meeting of east and west essos there's two sides to essos and really we only know about the western side the free seas and the slavers bay and the the Dothraki Sea. We don't really know about a shy and the Bone Mountains and all the stuff that's out that way. But this is the uh, yeah the, the meeting point between the two sides. There's another quote here from uh, Daenerys when she I think it's when her and Jorah are riding through the little path of statues and stolen gods and whatever. And it says, "Stone kings look down on her from their thrones, their faces chipped and stained, even their names lost in the mists of time." And when I reread that, it reminded me of John thinking about the Winterfell crypts, and I knew there was somewhere there was a, a similar quote, and I did find it in the end. So this is from John, limping past the Stone Kings on their thrones, their grey granite eyes turned to follow him as he passed, and their grey granite fingers tightened on the hilts of the rusted swords upon their laps. So we just see there's some similar similar ideas there: the stone and being watched, and the uh, rusted sword and laps gives the idea of time and in Daenerys's quote it says lost in the mist of time so it's just a nice little connection between the two of them now early on we get a real sense that Daenerys is kind of tightroping between both parties and uh, by both parties I mean Viserys and the Dothraki she kind of she tries to defend one and then she has to defend the other and she's trying to protect them from each other basically because Viserys is obviously at, at odds with the Dothraki and the Dothraki aren't too fond of him either and she's kind of caught in the middle. But we also get the impression this is not going to last. And surprise, surprise, it does not. Viserys, we learn in this chapter, he's learned no lessons. He's still in his western clothing. And he still just refuses to make any effort to assimilate in any way. And it's not like he's really being asked to be part of their culture even in the same way that da Daenerys is. He's just kind of got to go along with it for a little bit. He did choose, choose to go with them. But no not having a part of it and he still believes that he will one day lead a people who <laughs> a people who call him the sawfoot king or the cart king and it's quite an amazing feat and obliviousness obliviousness he's just just flying over his head he's got no idea 
There's a kind of a bit of irony, actually, in Daenerys pointing out to us that the Jothraki, they specifically don't respect Viserys because he can't ride when he's when he's been told off and he has to either walk or go in the cart because that's that's a big no-no in their culture. Strength is riding. So it's important that we get that now, given what happens to Drogo later when he can't ride. We've got a little bit of uh, foreshadowing there. A little, Well, it's just information that we're going to use later on. I do wonder what would have happened if Viserys had assimilated better and hadn't made demands left, right and centre. Even if he'd just worn the Dothraki clothes. If he just kept his mouth shut, maybe that would have been enough. Would Drogo have eventually gifted him this army? Does that mean giving him 10,000 Dothraki screamers and saying good luck? That doesn't seem like a long-lasting arrangement. They probably wouldn't get far and the Dothraki just turn on Viserys anyway. Does it mean Drogo personally comes with Viserys to Westeros? Maybe, but he, so far he definitely doesn't seem inclined that way. And so we could believe that although Viserys is going about it the complete wrong way and is obvious to his detriment eventually, maybe he does have a point that Drogo just never actually would have given him an army. And who can blame him? Why would you want to give Viserys an army? We also get the first mention of Barristan the Bold in, in Daenerys' POV, obviously, and that's going to have, uh, they're obviously going to intertwine later. But apart from that random note, we're, I'm going to go back to Viserys because it feels genuinely sad, actually, that Daenerys makes these clothes and invites him to dinner and she makes a real effort. And this is after all of Jorah's comments about he can't sweep a, a stable and anything else, just completely disparaging her brother. And she still makes that effort that extends that olive branch she could have already abandoned him very easily and just said all right if you're going to be like that be like that and we'll see who comes out better but she doesn't she makes a heartfelt effort and Viserys he not only kind of either doesn't realize or just dismisses that effort entirely but worse he reacts violently instead and it's just heartbreaking really imagining how Daenerys must feel at just this kind of slap in the face but thankfully it's the last straw for her and she's not going to put up with this anymore. I like that after that moment of self-power, she draws, uh, I think she draws one of the eggs uh, close as, it, as if the the two events are connected. Her standing up for herself is inherently connected to her dragon. She's drawing power from them already. I like that. We're going to see a lot of that later on. And it just reminds us that even with her becoming more and more Dothraki, she is still a dragon, a Targaryen at heart. That's still her power source. And to finish off today, the last note for this Daenerys, quick one for this Daenerys chapter. Uh, I think it ends quite similar to that early... Well, actually, not even ends. It just is quite similar to that early Catelyn chapter in the Vale. We get a lot of world building. There we meet the Eyrie hit and the Vale. And here we meet Face Dothraki and we get a lot of Dothraki world building. But it's also a disappointing ending. It seems to be going quite well. She, Daenerys... She seems to be getting on okay and finds this new city. Uh, but it ends on a disappointing note in the same way that Catelyn, she finally reached the destination, thought she was going to get some help, and then she actually met Lysa. So we had both. We end both chapters with siblings clashing. Now, it seems like the Viserys Daenerys clash is a lot worse than the Lysa Catelyn clash, but it's clashing all the same. They're not getting on. So, yeah, cool comparison there. And that is about it everybody that's our seven chapters that's the midway point of uh, game of thrones doesn't seem like it does it when you think back i think it's easy to forget how much we actually get post ned's beheading maybe that's a show influencing us there probably for me anyway but yes there we go seven chapters in the book we are back next week i think we've got like four straight weeks until uh, aziz and the share are off on their travels again so obviously massive thank you to both of them for their their brilliant live streams all their hard work you guys don't see enough of what goes on they deserve all the praise in the world and i thank them again for letting me be a part of it it's really fun to do these little scraps and scrolls and uh, be involved get my notes on the live stream and picking up the extras here i enjoy it and i hope you guys do too so again let me say thank you to our patrons i hope you enjoyed getting this a day early and to everyone else i hope you enjoyed the episode anyway don't forget to let us know if you got any comments or suggestions or you just want to chime in some of these notes and ideas that have come on these chapters or for next week or anything we'd love to hear from you 
other than that like i said at the beginning make sure you check out that guest episode with um with shakes of thrones that's all on twitter everywhere you can find that as normal and all the history of west Joss videos live streams and podcasts you're going to want to check those out so until then everybody i'll see you next week enjoy enjoy